Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Okay, Danny, let's get started. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot. How doers get more done. Here at The Home Depot... We want to help you do big, bigger, even epic. From small tools to earth-moving equipment, we've got your DIY covered, no matter how big or small. And at The Home Depot, you can rent and reserve online and pick up in-store. The Home Depot app, how doers get more done. This week, we try to work with a homeowner to try to determine the wall she wants to remove. Is it a load-bearing wall? Very, very important to decide that before you grab the sledgehammer. Another thing, paint sprayers. We get a lot of questions about paint sprayers. Is it feasible to spray certain projects that you're working on around the house? There's a couple different sprayers that are available. Both of them have specific tasks that they do really, really well. We'll tell you all about that. Nail pops. If you have drywall in your house, and most of you do, you're going to have just a little round hole that surfaces from time to time. What causes it and what can you do to repair it? We'll tell you all about it. Also, removing popcorn ceilings. If you've done it, you know it can be a mess. There are some little tricks to make that project go a little easier. Even though you might end up with a little of the white stuff in your hair, uh, there's still a very practical way of removing that. Joe, what about that simple solution for this podcast? Well, I've got a quick tip on how to spray paint a door without having to wait for one side to dry and then flip it over. With this tip, you can paint the entire door in just minutes and get every surface and every edge. So it's like levitating it, like magic. Yeah, it's like levitating. That's exactly right. Yeah. David Copperfield and I came up with this. Good, good. You're going to want to stick around and, and hear that. So let's get started. Now we're going to get right to the Today's Homeowner Hotline. Wilma is on the line right now. Wilma, welcome to the show, and tell us what's going on around your house there. <laughs> Thanks, Danny. Um, well, my husband and I are really amateur do-it-yourselfers, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Uh, we, we've attempted some marginal things and, and mm-hmm. had some marginal success <laughs> with those <laughs> marginal things. <laughs> But we keep, there's this one wall in our home that we keep looking at and thinking it would be so nice if that wall weren't here. <laughs> and how, how do you go about determining if a wall in your home is load-bearing? Is there any easy, definitive way to know? Well, we can we can give you some things to look for, but um, it, it a lot of times does take a fairly educated eye in order to determine, you know, if a, a wall can be removed. And any wall that's removed, you have to do certain things to make sure there's no shifting or any consequences after that. You know, one of the things that you'll see when you're in the attic looking at that wall. Um, you will um, you, you'll be able to see if the ceiling joist um, cross over it. Um, or they join on top of it. You'll also see occasionally where there will be braces going from on top of a wall to the sections or components of the roof. Anything that's sitting on a wall like that in the attic does mean it is holding some weight and it's there for a reason. So essentially it is a load-bearing wall. But if you're looking there and you're raking your insulation back and you're looking at the wall that you're trying to you know, determine whether or not you want to remove, it and no other wood is sitting on top of it, then it most likely is a non-load bearing wall and can be removed. But, um, you know, um, I've I've been a remodeling contractor for many, many years and I've taken out, probably taken out more walls than I've actually built. And, um, but, but so I can tell just by glancing if it's one, I can tell you this, any wall in any home just about can be removed. Some are more expensive than others and require beams to support it overhead, but just about any wall can be removed. And again, it's just uh, some will take a little more investment than, than others. So that would be the first thing I would look at is if there's any other wood positioned on top of that wall when you look at it in the attic. Okay. All right. Sounds like there's a trip to the attic in my future. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
it may wait until November. It's too hot right now. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is very hot up there. But that's one of the things you you need to think about. And uh, we, uh, you know, it, it can be a very positive project when you remove a wall. But I'll tell you what: a lot of people don't consider flooring. Mm-hmm. You have to match up that flooring. You know, somehow you just can't oh, yeah. nail a board down. So if you have one type of floor in one room and, and a different type in the other, you'll have to determine what to do there. So yeah. that can represent a fair amount of cost. Also, you're talking about a very visible patch in your ceiling mm. um, of your drywall or plaster, whatever you have. That mm-hmm. should not be taken lightly because uh, you don't want to, if you remove that wall, you want to remove any sign that a wall was ever there. So right. that's something that you would really have to, to look at and consider in the scope of work, the cost of it, mm-hmm. and so forth. And and Joe, there's another thing there that um, uh, always plagues somebody when they're taking a wall out, electrical. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm assuming, Wilma, this wall has some electricity in it. It does. It does. Yeah, because code would require it if it's if the wall is more than like four feet long, would have to have um, you know electric electricity in it. Now, you can reposition that um, somewhere else, if it if there's like a close if it's close to an, a nearby wall that's not being removed, but ordinarily all that is removed, and so that's an additional cost. Um, but but Danny's right. You know, some people think, well, if it's a load bearing wall, I can't move it. No, you can you can remove a load bearing wall. It's going to cost you two to three times, maybe four times more than removing a partition. And a partition is just a load a wall that's not load bearing Uh um, because that you can just you could just remove and as far as patching the the ceiling um, which is a good point the typically the best way to do that because remove a wall you might have like a four or five inch piece of drywall going in the ceiling that's now missing and if you just try to patch that it's really hard to hide so it's usually better to cut back at least a foot or two on either side and either put in a full sheet or a half sheet of sheetrock. And this way, it gives you a larger area to sort of blend it from one room to the other instead of a little strip that you're trying to put in there. Um, but either way, if you want to know it, it, how to, the easiest way, as Danny mentioned, if a lo- wall's load bearing is up in the attic. Fortunately, you do have access to the attic. Um, and if you see Joyce running parallel with the wall, Chances are it's just a partition wall. Going perpendicular to the wall and joists sitting on top of that wall, well, that wall is load-bearing and supporting it. All right, perpendicular. Okay, I got it. Thanks so much, guys. Good luck. Thanks so much for being with us, Wilma, and best of luck to you on that. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Thinking about getting a new tub or shower but not sure who to trust, one call to Bathfitter makes it easy, or just go to bathfitter.com. They'll install your new bath or shower in a day or less with their unique tub-over-tub process so it fits into your schedule. Bathfitter offers hundreds of design options so your bath or shower fits your style. And every high-quality tub or shower comes with a lifetime guarantee so it fits your standards. There's a reason why over 2 million people have welcomed Bathfitter into their homes. It just fits. 800-946-4420 is the Today's Homeowner Hotline, and that's exactly what Mary did. She's on the line right now, and Mary, welcome to the show, and uh, tell us what's going on around your house. Hi, Danny. Uh, I have a a house with fish-scale vinyl trim, and I'm interested in a paint sprayer to help me recover that. It needs to be repainted. Okay. I love that fish-scale site. Yeah, I do, too. Uh, shingles, really, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. I like that as well. Want to explain to listeners who might not know exactly what fish scale siding uh-huh. is? Yeah, uh-huh. they're, they're, you may have seen it, and not recognize it, but they're usually shingles, most often wood, but I think they actually make vinyl ones now that are shaped like a fish scale, so it's rounded at the bottom, and they don't do the whole house. They usually do the upper portions of a gable or accents here and there, but they're really beautiful, and you hardly ever see them anymore, maybe because they're just more expensive than regular shingles. No more expensive to install, but um, Mary, I'm glad you have them, and you're thinking of taking care of them. Well, thank you. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you, some of the uh, sprayers can be pretty aggressive. You know, there, there's kind of several different categories, but basically the airless sprayer is what you see a lot of the professional contractors using when they're really aggressively painting the outside of a house. But what um, we found is, you know, a low-pressure type sprayer is um, a lot more controllable, and uh, I know Chelsea absolutely loves it, and she'll use it. Uh, she'll paint one shelf board, and she's breaking out the, the sprayer because the result are so good. Uh, You're able to control the spray so well. And uh, the one that uh, she's been using and uh, 
Uh, as a matter of fact, she used it a lot this week on a project that we did. Um, she ordered from Woodcraft, woodcraft.com, and it's called a Home Right. And uh, very reasonable, very easy to clean, very easy to use. It's also not so loud like a lot of those electric ones um, in the past had that obnoxious grinding to sell to it. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and it works inside, outside, but it just controls the paint so much better that you don't have the problems with as much um, with the overspray. You still have to do a little taping and, you know, um, kind of um, covering up around the area that you're painting. But uh, I think you'll find that that's about the easiest one I've ever seen to use. Well, that sounds good. My husband has been really hesitant about this, but Chelsea makes it look so easy when she uses it on your show. Well, well, it, it definitely is, and I can say she's a big fan of it. And uh, uh, but we, we were really hesitant a couple years ago before we found this particular model because we just had bad experiences with with others that you know spitting the paint out, and it would go for a few minutes, and then you you know you'd have to stop. And finally, you just say to heck with that. Where's the roller and the brush? But um, but this one just I don't know. They've got it figured out, and again, very reasonable. And she's painted, uh, heck, she painted a island in a kitchen. Um, with very little cover up around it, and finished it in 30 minutes, and we were just amazed at how quickly that that paint job inside an existing house, and how good the paint job held up, and so forth. And then we were using it on the ex on an exterior, uh, painting some doors just this past week. So, uh, so I think that's I think that's your secret to it. And it's like so many things, Mary. Once you have one of these tools, you end up finding so many ways of using it. Probably your neighbors recruiting you from time to time. You have to be careful on that one. Uh, but um, I think that'll uh, that'll solve your problem. You'll be real satisfied with that. Well, that sounds great because I was not looking forward to trying to use a brush on all those scalloped fish scale trim. Oh, oh, I don't, I don't blame you at all. Just be careful when you, you know, getting up that ladder or scaffolding or whatever. You know, make sure that that's in good shape uh, so that you're not, uh, you don't step off of it and that kind of thing. But that's commonly called an HVLP is what they call it, HVLP sprayer. And again, you can go to Woodcraft right now and uh, order the Home Right one, just like Chelsea uses. Okay, well, that sounds great, Danny. Thank you. Okay, Mary. So glad that you were able to spend some time with us here on the Today's Home on the Radio Show, and hope you have a great weekend. Thank you. You too. Time for our best new product segment brought to you by the Home Depot. How doers get more done. Drill drivers are probably the most common cordless tool used by homeowners and pros alike. And the more we use them, the more we expect from them. So DeWalt is delivering more with this new brushless hammer drill driver combo kit with FlexVolt. The half-inch hammer drill driver in, in this kit has FlexVolt advantage, which means it gets up to 42% more power when paired with flex volt batteries. It also has a three-speed transmission for greater versatility and three-mode LED lighting that's 20 times brighter than the predecessor. Now, that's true. A light on the drill. If, if your drill and your drill driver does not have one of the little LED lights on it, I'm telling you, you will want one because when you almost every time you're drilling wherever you are, a little extra light can certainly help a lot. Now, there's also a 20-volt max XR impact driver, a flex volt battery, a compact 20 volt max battery, and a 6 amp charger in the combo kit. Both tools are compatible with all the DeWalt 20 volt max and flex volt batteries. So if you expect more from a drill driver, this is the one that can deliver it. You can check it out yourself by going to homedepot.com. We have a couple calls that we want to tackle from the hotline right now. This one came in from Georgia. Hey, Danny and Joe. I've noticed a few nail pops in my drywall. What's the best way to resolve this issue? Okay. Well, it's not uncommon, and basically a nail pop is when the nail, um, most commonly, sometimes a screw will turn loose, but a lot of times they may have just barely missed the stud that they were trying to nail it in, or sometimes even a direct hit and any vibration that takes place will make that nail start working out, and it'll form just a little round circle pop on the actual drywall. Well, the best thing to do is to take some um, needle nose pliers and pull that that nail out, replace it with a screw, and just barely, you know, sink it below the surface 
of the drywall, then take some joint compound and apply over it. Sometimes you need a second coat with a little bit of sanding on it so that you erase that. Then you'll do the touch-up painting. So they're fairly easy. Hopefully uh, you, you don't have a lot of them, but this is a, a very easy way. And step-by-step uh, instructions are available right now at Today's Homeowner. Dot com. Here's another one that came in from Alaska, uh, and it's James on the line. Hi, this is James. I'm in Connecticut, Alaska. I uh, recently purchased a new home, and it has popcorn ceilings, which my wife and I do not like. I'd love to remove them, but I'm not sure if this is a DIY project or if I should get a professional. So if I can do this myself, what's the best process to remove that stuff from the ceiling? Okay, James, again, we got a lot of information there at todayshomeowner.com to steer you there. Joe, uh, so many people are tackling this on their own. And, of course, manufacturers are responding with some of the scraping tools that are available that have the little bags that will minimize uh, the mess. But, um, you know, it, it, this is a, a good example of a project that you really need to do your research on to make it much, much easier because it can be quite the mess. Well, what this proves is you can even move as far away as Alaska and not get away from the popcorn ceilings. Right, and really, the we have never gotten a question, or excuse me, a caller who said, I'd love to put popcorn ceiling in my home. How do I do that? Nope, that is not what you ever hear. <laughs> and if you ever wonder why there are so many popcorn ceilings, it's cheap to install. That's why, for the builder. Um, the homeowners typically hate it. But yeah, the first thing I would we always recommend is testing it for asbestos. Now, James said this is a new home, so it's probably not an issue, but usually any any asbestos that um, would be in a, an acoustic ceiling uh, or spray on acoustic ceiling, which is what popcorn is, is um, it might have asbestos prior to 1980. So this probably is an issue, but for people who are, who are um, you know, have an older popcorn ceiling, check, test it with asbestos first. But yeah, I mean, you want to if you want to remove it as opposed to just cover it up with some other type of ceiling, um, it is a DIY project. Like Danny said, go to todayshomeowner.com. You can see the recipe for the spray. You just spray it on. Typically, you just spray it with uh, hot water with a little fabric softener, a little soap, and a pump-up sprayer. Um, and um, scraping it. Now, okay, so you're going to scrape it. You have to cover everything, of course, because this is going to be a huge mess. So how do you control the mess? Well, one way is with, there's a company called Homax, H-O-M-A-X, and they make a thing called, I think it's simply called a ceiling scraper, popcorn remover, or something like that. It's a 12-inch blade, but the interesting thing, and you can fit it onto a long handle, it has like a little rectangular metal frame just below the scraper blade where you can clip on a plastic bag. So as you're scraping, all this wet gunk falls into the bag. So um, that would be the way to do it. But again, go to the website and you'll see a video. Danny's done this many times and has videotaped it most of the times. Um, and he'll show you also how to prep the room, which is just as important. And then also after you finish that, because you're saturating the ceiling with this liquid, you're going to want to dry it out. So be able to, you know, have your air conditioning going, your heater going, or a fan blowing to dry it out sufficiently. Then if you have any little dings and dents here and there, which are almost inevitable, then you'll need to patch those with drywall compound before you paint it twice with ceiling paint. So it's a bit of a process and uh, you can do it a room at a time that'll make it a little more manageable. I want to remind you about uh, your basement and some of the things you kind of need to think about in terms of some uh, maintenance from time to time, you know, because like any part of your home, that basement door will need a little maintenance from time to time to make sure it continues doing the job well for a long time. The first thing is to inspect each spring and fall is the finish of the door. If the paint on the door is scratched or chipped, you should touch up those areas as soon as possible because exposed metal will begin to rust and that will shorten the life of the door considerably. New coat of paint may be necessary for the entire door every few years because of how it's exposed to the elements. Next, you'll want to check the area under the door for moisture. If you see any signs of water, Look at the seams between the basement door and the concrete foundation. If the caulk in this uh, seam has been damaged or deteriorated, you want to apply a fresh bead of caulk to solve that problem. You know, even without leaks, some moisture is natural in a space that's below grade, so it's important to open the door frequently during good weather to circulate some good fresh air and dry things out in there. At the top of each door, there's a U-shaped flange called the header channel. This moves water away from the opening like a gutter, and just like the gutter 
water on your roof, it tends to fill up with debris from time to time. To avoid an overflow or leakage, clean out the header channel periodically, and all moving parts require some lubrication. So a few sprays of a multi-purpose uh, lubricant on the hinges and slide bolt will make a big difference and keep the doors swinging freely. Now, these tips are brought to you by Bilco, the leader in basement access products. To learn more about your basement, visit bilco.com. Hey, let's go right to an email here. We've got a lot of great emails this week. This came in from Marie. Hi, Danny and Joe. My plastic laminate floor is beginning to develop gaps between the planks. Is there anything I can use to fill in those narrow spaces? Uh, Joe, we've heard this quite a bit on that, um, not maybe acclimating the floor before it's be, it's installed. And then right. here, when you have cracks like this, the, it's a shrinkage of that. Boy, they um, Maurice definitely would not want to fill that with anything because that would end up being a problem later on. Yeah. First of all, what are you going to fill it with? Like, you know, wood filler or caulk or whatever. And then what happens when those planks expand, which I assume they're going to. Now, we don't know is um, how old this floor is. She said that it's beginning to develop gaps, so I guess they were tightly together. They weren't installed with gaps, so they've developed these gaps probably from shrinkage. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, I don't think there's much she can do, and I bet, you know, and as the seasons get colder and the heat comes on, they're probably going to shrink even a little more, but come summer, they're going to expand. And if they can't expand, they're going to start buckling. So I think she, they, they shouldn't have gaps in it though. I mean, no, uh, you know, it really shouldn't, but she has them, <laughs> excuse me, she has them and I wouldn't fill them because then they wouldn't be able to expand and then you might have a buckling problem. And it's the same way with a, a traditional hardwood floor. Absolutely, yeah. One that's a engineered floor or the um, old traditional three-quarter inch oak floor or pine. Um, you really don't want to fill those gaps because, you know, during the summer, of course, right now during this time of the year, generally is when you don't have the gaps. It's when it starts getting cold and maybe there's not a vapor barrier under your home. And then it starts to, you know, kind of shrink down a little bit and cracks will form around your house that were not there during the middle of the summer. So it's just one of those expansion contraction things that happen all the time with your home. So hopefully that'll help you out, Marie. And uh, again, if you'd like to send us an email, it's pretty easy. Today's homeowner.com slash ask. This one's from Hannah from Rhode Island who writes, We want to update the hall bath in our 1960s home, but everyone keeps telling us we will be without it for weeks while the tub and shower walls are demolished and all the work is being done. The bathroom desperately needs to be updated, but we can't really afford to lose it for that long. Is there another option? Well, Hannah, you're not the only one in that situation, and I've been there myself. So that's a really good question. Removing and replacing a tub and shower surround is a very big job that requires several trades get involved, and that's what really takes a lot of the time. But there is a solution that simplifies the process and speeds up the timeline considerably. The folks at Bath Fitter can custom make an acrylic tub and shower wall that can go over your existing tub and surround in just one day. They start by measuring your bathtub and then create an exact replica which fits right over the old one, so there's no demolition necessary. Now, before the new tub liner goes in, the existing surfaces will be cleaned and repaired to ensure that the foundation of the whole tub is solid and that your solution will last a lifetime. And because the liner is custom fit to your tub, it's guaranteed to be watertight. The good news is that you can still change the color and design of the bathtub and the walls to something more modern that fits your style that you're looking for. In fact, Bathfitter has a design your own bath tool on their website, so you can choose from hundreds of customization options and accessories and view them all together to ensure that your new bath is exactly what you envisioned. Now, good luck with your project. Let us know how it turns out. And to find out more about Bathfitter, you can check them out at bathfitter.com. This is the time of the show when we turn it over to my buddy Joe Truini for another simple solution. All right, Danny, not too long ago, just a few minutes ago, we were talking about spray painters mm -hmm. and how handy they are to have. And once you have one, you'll be using it for all kinds of jobs around your house, including one of the best things it's used for is painting doors. Because often you have to you paint one side of the door and then, what, you have to wait a few hours before you can flip it over and paint the other side. So here's a simple solution on painting doors without the weight. What you want to do is first, well, you're going to use a sprayer, but you're also going to take two screw hooks. And they could be you know pretty good size, maybe an inch and a half, two inches long and you're going to screw them into the top corners of the door. One on right near the edge of the door, two of them. And then 
you find in your shed or workshop or basement or wherever where you can uh, install a couple of loops of of um, cable or rope and just hook the door so it's hanging. So now it's completely suspended off the floor and just hanging. And then you can spread some plastic around if you want to, you know, protect the surfaces from nearby surfaces from overspray. So with the door hanging off these hooks from the joists above, you can spray paint the front door and go around the back of the door and spray paint it immediately, the edges. And if you go to todayshomeowner.com slash simple solutions right now, you can see a video of me showing this tip. And it's a great way to do it. That door hangs. You can easily apply one or two coats if you need to. Apply primer if it's not primed first. Let that dry without moving the door and come back. Once that dry and put on the top coat. Um, it's a lot quicker then using a paint brush and a roller, especially if it's a panel door, has bevels and lots of moldings to, to molded edges to paint around. So next time you want to paint a door, try this trick. Oh, that's a great simple solution. Another great simple solution. There's over 500 of them waiting on you right now at todayshomeowner.com slash simple solutions. Here at the Home Depot, we want to help you do big, bigger, even epic from small tools to earth-moving equipment, we've got your DIY covered, no matter how big or small. And at The Home Depot, you can rent and reserve online and pick up in-store. The Home Depot app, how doers get more done. Now it's time for our podcast question of the week. This comes from Michigan. Karen asks, how do I reinstall a lock for a vinyl fence? Screws have worked out, and they're not catching to hold again, so the latch slide is fine, but how can I keep this assembly together? Well, I know exactly what she's talking about, because, you know, right. a lot of those screws, I mean, it doesn't take much on some of the vinyl to just simply pull out of there. Some of the vinyl fencing I've seen, uh, some big problems on that. The most foolproof way is actually go with a bolt and a nut, and that might not sound like it would be very attractive, but if you're... If you're using that and going through the component of the fence with a thin diameter bolt, maybe with a washer on both ends and the nut, then once you get it working and, and doing well, then to take your hacksaw and cut the excess threads off. Now, I've even seen people use white paint, assuming it's a white vinyl fence, um, white paint, or even the material whiteout that you might have in your desk drawer oh, yeah? to just dab it onto the cut area um, so that it you know makes it blend in a little better but it also will prevent that nut from backing off since you have basically glue on it and right. paint serves it the same way that will resist that but uh that's about the only way i know you could really guarantee that that latch won't continue being a problem well bolting through the post and the fence whatever this is you know it's probably a a gate and a post right so um, these are hollow, which is why the screws probably worked out. What I would do, there are two options, I think, if this was my fence. First, um, you could reposition both the lock and the latch. Simply move it down, up or down. Um, and if you can move it just a little bit, you, can, you don't even have to worry about the old holes. Then drill a pilot hole and drive in the same screws or a different size screw. Or what I think I would do first before I reposition them, keep them in the same place and just put in a larger screw. But in a larger gauge, it would be a sheet metal screw because you'd be threading right through a self-threading sheet metal screw. Now, you might have to enlarge the holes in the metal parts, in the latch and in the catch or whatever. I guess it would be the latch and the locking mechanism. You may have mm -hmm. to enlarge those holes mm -hmm. so the screw passes through it because you're using a larger screw. But that would be a way of this way you can keep it in the same place, just drive in a larger screw, and, and that would thread in. Just don't over-tighten it. A lot of times there will you know, be a fair amount, of, like a little bit of a footprint on that particular um, vinyl to vinyl connection. Right. Uh, boy, I tell you, the two-part epoxy works really, really well for that, too. So to line up the screw and have it all ready to go and then to mix up the two-part epoxy and put it on the back of that, put it on then attach the screw so that it holds it in place, that surface-to-surface -surface a lot of times will help even more, and that's a lot more attractive, really, than running the bolts all the way through it. So a few different techniques there that you can try. Karen, best of luck on that. We really appreciate you sending in your question. We'd love to get your question as well that we can answer here on the Today's Homeowner podcast. Just send it to us by going to todayshomeowner.com slash 
podcast. And again, thank you for all the great reviews we've been getting. More and more people are downloading the podcast each and every week, and we appreciate each and every one of you taking some time to listen to the Today's Homeowner Podcast. I'm Danny Lifford, along with my buddy Joe Truini. We'll see you next week.